sixth edition of Toke Signals TV, where we bring you the biggest cannabis stories of the week every week. I'm Steve Elliott, editor and host of ToqueSignals.com, and I'll be bringing you the news this week. First of all, though, let's do our traditional bud pick of the week. This week I visited a dispensary in North Seattle called The Solution. They have a $10 gram across the board donation for flowers, and they have quite a good selection. They had about 17 strains the day I visited, and Bud Tender Dylan was the guy who helped me. They have multiple Bud Tenders and multiple Bud Bars at any given time. I believe I counted five Bud Bars in there, so they are able to get patients in and out a lot more quickly that way. Dylan was knowledgeable, he was patient, he showed me all the strains I wanted to see, and that's how I arrived upon the beauty you see here called Sugar Plum. It's an Indica Sativa Hybrid. As I said, everything is $10 a gram in the solution. And this is a good medication if you need the pain relief of Indica, yet you are going to need some of the energy of Sativa. So it's not strictly a morning medication, not strictly a nighttime, but it's one of those that you can actually use all day long without getting either couch locked or too hyper. It's recommended and it also has the delicious fruit terpenes that potentiate the effects of the cannabinoids themselves and in the process lend it a wonderful aroma and flavor. So I can give Sugar Plum my thumbs up. Over the week, we got to visit Farmer Tom down in Vancouver, Washington. He's becoming one of my favorite people. I met him at Hemp Fest. He's the author of the Cannabis Consumer's Guide, and he has a great greenhouse. I saw some of the healthiest looking plants I've seen in a long time. You can see me here with one of his Indica Kush varieties just coming into flower, looking very beautiful as you can see. And I also had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Tibbs, who's the greenhouse cat there at Farmer Tom's operation. Mr. Tibbs, you can tell when you look at him closely, has been through a lot in his life. He's not a young cat. He is, however, a very tough cat, and he's a very cool cat. And I was honored to get some lap time with purring from Mr. Tibbs. And you can see him in the chair here waiting for me to come back so we can visit again. I'll see you soon, Mr. Tibbs. Let's get into the news. We had one of the biggest stories in the cannabis community in a while this week. There has been a lot of debate as to the exact meaning of it and as to the fallout. What can't be denied is that this story represents great forward progress and is an example of the momentum that is with the cannabis cause these days. This week, Attorney General Eric Holder announced that the federal government will allow marijuana legalization to go forward in Colorado and Washington without suing to stop it. They are reserving their right to do so in the future. However, they say that the, they are not using those resources in that way right now. So while it's kind of a political lukewarm statement, it does represent a big step forward. And that is according to almost anyone you ask. It was at a Thursday press briefing when the DOJ announced it will allow these two states to move forward with recreational legalization. They are establishing state regulated systems of marijuana production and distribution for the first time in the United States. Holder told the governors of Washington and Colorado that the DOJ would allow these states to create their systems of regulation. And this directive is also seen as applying to the 20 states that have legalized cannabis for medicinal purposes. So that can be good news for safe access for a lot of people who need this medically. Deputy Attorney General James Cole also issued a three and a half page memo to U.S. attorneys. There is some misgiving among the community because there have been similar announcements in the past as in 2009 when the Obama administration announced that it was backing off marijuana. And then in 2011, accompanying the crackdown, it, there was another memorandum which kind of enlarged the sphere under which U.S. attorneys could go after the dispensaries again. So these federal policies can backsolate, they can change. And until federal laws themselves are changed, we can't relax at all. At the same time, though, People with the marijuana policy project, such as Dan Riffle and other experts in the field, hail this as a great step forward. 
Dan Riffle called it, in fact, a major and historic step towards ending marijuana prohibition. He called the DOJ's decision to allow implementation of these laws in Colorado and Washington a clear signal that states are free to determine their own policies with respect to marijuana. Riffle said he applauded the Department of Justice and other federal agencies for their thoughtful approach and sensible decision. And he said that it's time for the federal government to start working with state officials to develop enforcement policies that respect state voters as well as federal interests. And Riffle rightly pointed out that the next step is for Congress to act. These laws need fixing at the federal level. No adjustment to federal policy, no adjustment to federal enforcement can ever substitute for changing the laws so that marijuana is no longer a Schedule One controlled substance. Cannabis doesn't even belong on that schedule of controlled substances, and the fact that it's Schedule One, the most tightly regulated of all, is completely ridiculous. Aaron Smith, the executive director of the National Cannabis Industry Association, the NCIA, said he was encouraged by the response from the Obama administration. He said, at the heart of this guidance is a willingness to respect the voters who have decided a regulated marijuana market is preferable to a criminal market in their states. Smith rightly pointed out that cannabis-related businesses in these states are creating thousands of jobs and generating tens of millions of dollars in tax revenue. He called those clear public benefits. Now is not the time to push marijuana sales back underground, Smith said. The new voter-approved regulated systems in Colorado and Washington should be allowed to proceed. Ethan Nadelman of the Drug Policy Alliance called the announcement a demonstration of the sort of political vision and foresight from the White House we've been seeking for a long time. I must admit, I was expecting a yellow light from the White House, Nadelman said, but this light looks a lot more greenish than I had hoped. The White House is basically saying to Washington and Colorado, proceed with caution, Nadelman said. Steve Sarich of the Washington State-Based Cannabis Action Coalition is always a skeptic when it comes to government announcements. And his skepticism needs to be part of our reaction to this announcement because we all know how quickly governmental policies can change. You know how you can tell if the state and the feds are actually serious? Sarich told me. Let's see if the state and the feds stop using high-intensity drug trafficking area HIDTA, HIDTA grants to the cities and the medical states to use local and state law enforcement to enforce federal law over state law. The state has been complicit in this, according to Surich. The Attorney General's office has signed these agreements to take what Surich calls federal bribes to ignore state law, these HIDTA grants. If you can still get raided and charged federally when you're not breaking state law, they are simply jerking our chain again and hoping that we buy their new flavor of bullshit, Surich said. These hit to grants must stop or we'll never have legal, medical, or recreational marijuana in Washington. The eight hit to areas throughout the United States leave plenty of leeway for prosecutors on a mission against marijuana to, tar can to target cannabis businesses. Since many anti-pot prosecutors have certainly shown a willingness to aggressively and creatively interpret Department of Justice marijuana enforcement guidelines in the past when it comes to medical marijuana, it remains to be seen how the new federal policy will play out on the ground when it comes to recreational pot. While we know the federal government has reversed course on this sort of announcement in the past, this has the potential to be a major advancement in the history of drug reform said retired Seattle Police Chief Norm Stamper, who is now an advisory board member at Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, LEAP, which is a group of law enforcement officials opposed to the war on drugs. Allowing states to legalize and regulate marijuana will funnel millions of dollars of profits from the criminal organizations that have controlled the trade into the hands of legitimate businesses that check IDs and create jobs and badly needed tax revenues, Stamper said. For me, this means my fellow officers will be able to focus on their real job of preventing and solving violent crime, increasing their ability to do that job, and returning honor to the profession of policing. Neil Franklin, the executive director of LEAP, added, 
the Attorney General and the Obama administration are exhibiting inspired leadership. The message to the people of the other 48 states, to all who value personal freedom and responsible regulation is clear. Seize the day. Tom Angel, chairman of Marijuana Majority, a pro-cannabis lobbying group, said it's nice to hear that the Obama administration doesn't at this point intend to file a lawsuit to overturn the will of the voters and states that have opted to modernize their marijuana policies. But it remains to be seen how individual U.S. attorneys will interpret the new guidance and whether they will continue their efforts to close down marijuana businesses that are operating in accordance with state law. The administration's statement that it doesn't think busting individual users should be a priority remains meaningless as it has never been a federal focus to go after people just for using small amounts of marijuana, according to Angel. The real question, Tom told me, is whether the president will call off his federal agencies that have been on the attack and finally let legal marijuana businesses operate without harassment, or if he wants the DEA and prosecutors to keep intervening as they have throughout his presidency and thus continue forcing users to buy marijuana on the illegal market where much of the profits go to violent drug cartels and gangs. The Washington State Liquor Control Board, and that's the state agency here in Washington, in charge of implementing marijuana legalization, issued a press statement praising the Obama administration and state officials for forward progress. The Washington State Liquor Control Board would like to thank the Obama administration, particularly Attorney General Eric Holder and the Department of Justice for its guidance today, the WSLCB said in a prepared statement. They also thanked Governor Jay Inslee and Attorney General Bob Ferguson for their leadership. The concern at this point is a statement made just about a day later by Governor Inslee in which he called uh, the medical marijuana business a problem and he seemed to indicate that the state might move under the terms of 502 to for all practical effects shut the medical marijuana industry down in the state thus ending safe access for a lot of patients to medicinal strains that have been crafted to meet their symptoms now can this replace by a by a system which distributes only recreational marijuana without regard to its medicinal effects and without catering to the needs of individual patients. We have room for a lot of legitimate doubt in that regard. Let's move to New Jersey, where in response to the Department of Justice announcement this week, Governor Chris Christie says the Obama administration was wrong not to challenge those legal marijuana laws in Colorado and Washington. So Chris Christie's weighing in from New Jersey there. We can consider that the peanut gallery, I suppose. It's really no wonder that Chris Christie has been foot dragging for years when it comes to implementing the medical marijuana program in his own state, New Jersey. It was signed into law by his Democratic predecessor, John Corzine, on Corzine's last day in office. But Christie, a member of the GOP, seems to have put all the roadblocks he can in the way of implementation of this law and only now has the first dispensary just opened in New Jersey years after the law was signed by Christie's predecessor. Anyway, while speaking to a crowd in Point Pleasant, New Jersey on Thursday, Governor Christie said the Obama administration's decision not to legally challenge marijuana legalization in Colorado was a mistake that essentially legalizes cannabis. Christie vowed that will never happen in New Jersey while he is governor. But something tells me Christie doesn't have to worry that much about a second term. Of course, he was responding to Holder's announcement that the Obama administration is not going to sue Colorado and Washington over legalization. Based on assurances that those states will impose an appropriately strict regulatory system, the Department of Justice deferred its right to challenge the legalization laws at this time, while adding marijuana is and remains illegal under federal law. But Christie, who is a former U.S. attorney himself, claimed that the attorney general overstepped his authority. I think it's a mistake by the attorney general, frankly, Christie said. There's no such thing as medical marijuana. It's just marijuana. And that's a rather unfortunate thing for the governor of a medical marijuana state in charge of implementing its program 
to say on the face of it there. Christie continued, though he wasn't done at that point. He essentially, by fiat, legalized marijuana in Colorado and Washington, Governor Christie claimed. Now, of course, that is patently false. The voters of Colorado and Washington legalized marijuana, using their democratic right to do so. Governor Christie had better get that straight in a hurry. But he said legal marijuana is something that he would never allow to happen in New Jersey. So if you folks have ever considered voting for this man, I think it's time to reconsider. Christie said that marijuana legalization was to be decided by the Congress and the president, not by the attorney general. But he evidently forgot about the fact that we voters have something to say in that process as well. I think that it's time that Christie hears loudly and clearly from the voters when he's up for re-election. Moving on to a happier story, we have a study came out this week, and we're number one. Marijuana is the top illegal drug used worldwide. The most popular illegal drug in the world, according to the first ever global survey of illicit drug use. Although marijuana is most popular, the drugs that kill the most people are the opioid painkillers, such as Vicodin, Oxycontin, and Codeine. Cannabis, of course, has never killed anyone in history. In addition to cannabis and opioids, researchers looked at the abuse of cocaine and of amphetamines in the year 2010, based largely on previous studies. They didn't include ecstasy or psychedelic drugs due to lack of data. The scientists found that for all the drugs they studied, men in their 20s had the highest rates of abuse. The countries where drug use was most prevalent were Australia, the United Kingdom, Russia, and the United States. Results of the study were published this week in the scientific journal The Lancet. There weren't a whole lot of solid numbers for the scientists to rely upon. Even they admit this, but they came up with modeling techniques to reach estimates. Even if it is not very solid data, we can say definitely that, the, that there are drug problems in most parts of the world said Theo Boss of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. He's the study's senior author. And according to Boss, people tend to abuse drugs produced close to their homes, which is an interesting theory. He said that means cocaine in North America and amphetamines and opioids in Asia and Africa, if his hypothesis holds true. In the year 2010, there were an estimated 78,000 deaths due to illegal drug use. More than half of those were because of pharmaceutical painkillers. Now, even though the study caused them illegal drugs and because they were presumably being abused rather than taken as prescribed, these substances arguably aren't illegal since you can get them with a prescription. And the big pharmaceutical companies which manufacture them aren't in any danger of rage from the Drug Enforcement Administration. That's despite the fact that more than half of drug deaths worldwide are due to their products. Another revealing fact is that countries with the harshest laws against drugs have higher death rates for users compared to countries which rely on we humane policies regarding drug users, such as needle exchange programs, methadone clinics, and other harm reduction measures. The illicit use of prescribed opiates in the U.S has only happened in the last 10 years or so, claimed Michael Linsky of the National Addiction Center at King's College in London. He said it's possible in another 20 years that patterns will change again in ways that he can't predict. A decriminalized drug policy could potentially transform the public health approach to drug use, according to Vikram Patel of the Center for Global Mental Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He said that there would be enormous savings in the criminal justice system and that this money could then be used to fund addiction treatment programs. Let's hope that this kind of sanity soon comes to U.S. drug policy. And I hope that someone in charge notices the body count of the opiates versus zero deaths ever for marijuana. Moving on to a quite unlikely state for me to be reporting this about, at least in my mind. This week, a poll showed that a majority 
of voters in Utah support legalizing medical marijuana. This new poll of registered voters found majority support for medicinal use. Most voters in Utah, however, still oppose overall legalization. This random poll of 500 voters showed that 61% support allowing patients to use marijuana if their doctor recommends it. At the same time, though, 57% oppose legalizing cannabis for all adults, not just medicinal. But the fact that a sizable majority of voters in such a conservative state, after all, Utah politics are dominated by the Latter-day Saints Church, the Mormons. This is illustrative of just what a sea change has happened in American politics when it comes to cannabis. When 61% of Utah voters support medical marijuana, this is a change that is going to happen coast to coast. We expected most Utahns to oppose the general legalization of marijuana, but were honestly surprised that a majority of Utah voters indicated support for legalizing medical marijuana, said Connor Boyack, president of the Libertas Institute, which produced the poll. One might think, given the predominant political party and religion, that that wouldn't be the case. Evidently, many Utahns have been persuaded regarding the medical benefits of cannabis, which can offer sick people, he said. The polling organization, Libertas, and other organizations are going to push for a bill to allow for medical marijuana in Utah, according to Boyack, and he said he intends to make the case for it in the next session of the legislature. It's highly offensive that a lawmaker would stand between a patient and a doctor to dictate which medical options can or cannot be pursued, he said. We and other interested parties will definitely be looking to change the status quo. Among Republicans taking this phone survey, the, among the 500 voters, 75% said they opposed legalization of marijuana for recreational use, and only 46% said they would support legalization for medical reasons. The Republican Party, of course, thanks to the Mormon Church, heavily dominates Utah politics. The poll also found that only 50% of Mormons who responded support cannabis legalization for medical reasons, as compared to 61% of the population at large. Moving across country to the East Coast, up in New England anyway, a New Hampshire man got a year in jail this week after being spotted in his own How to Grow Marijuana videos. Now, if you don't have medical authorization to grow your plants, or if you don't live in a medically legal state, it's not a good idea to post How to Grow Marijuana videos online. If you're going to do so, you need to be really careful that you take measures not to end up in a cage because you're going to end up like this guy if you leave any loose end. And let me tell you what happened to him. Cal Berry is a 40-year-old guy. He didn't want to appear in the 35 anonymous clips he posted on YouTube. He didn't realize that his face was reflecting off of a shiny surface in his grow room. The cops saw it. He didn't realize that his name was on a package from a marijuana seed company. The cops saw it. Barry said he was growing the cannabis for his own use after undergoing 17 surgeries, which makes this case even sadder. This guy is a legitimate medical user. Now he's doing a year in prison. He pleaded guilty on Tuesday to manufacturing a controlled substance. He got a year in jail. They suspended four months of it, thankfully. So he's still got eight months to do. They find him $500. Showing how to grow it, how to set it up, what chemicals he uses, where he gets his seeds, said Assistant Rockingham County Attorney Jerome Blanchard. He's very detailed about how he's doing it. Authorities started watching the videos for clues after they got tipped off to their existence. And that's when they found Barry's face in the reflective surface. That's when they noticed his name on a package addressed to him in the video. In a video dated October 17, 2012, the defendant showed a package received from the United Kingdom containing marijuana seeds, and it shows the postage from the Royal Mail. The package had the defendant's name clearly visible on it. In court, Barry said he was doing it because of the pain he was in. I did it because since 13, I've had 17 surgeries, he said. I didn't realize how bad the medications I was on were clotting my judgment and killing me. 
Judge Marguerite Wageling agreed with the defense attorney that Barry was not a drug kingpin, but said she had a hard time believing all the marijuana he grew was for his personal use. So she gave him the year with four months suspended. Some unfortunate news from Michigan this week, where the Drug Enforcement Administration has conducted a series of smash and grab dispensary raids. DEA agents have conducted these searches over the past three weeks, actually, in cooperation with Michigan state law enforcement authorities in the Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti areas. Shops raided include one called the Shop in Ypsilanti. Two raids were conducted last week. They typically involve groups of federal DEA agents, sometimes assisted by local or state police, descending on medical marijuana dispensaries and unmarked vans and SUVs with no sirens, no flashing lights. The federal agents flash Michigan state warrants and they seize dried cannabis, growing plants, and cash. In this, in this series of raids, which started July 30th, the agents reportedly did not leave copies of the state warrants at three dispensaries that were raided. No arrests have been made in the raids. They're just smash and grab. The searches seem to end once the cash is seized, especially when dispensary employees start photographing the agents. The Michigan chapter of Americans for Safe Access has issued a raid alert after the Ann Arbor dispensary raid. In addition to these federally led raids, three dispensaries in Detroit were raided over the past week by the Detroit Police Department. They used the same pattern of quick entry and quick exit. In those raids, the Detroit police were accompanied by Michigan State Police, federal agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, and even a City of Detroit code enforcement official. Michigan medical marijuana advocates are concerned about the smash and grab tactics, especially since the agents are serving state-issued warrants, not federal ones. Causing additional worry is the DEA's reliance on state police instead of local police to support the raids. Critics speculate that the federal agents are using state law enforcement agencies to assist them rather than local police because in locations such as Ann Arbor, there is broad public support for the medical use of marijuana. Our last story this week is an object lesson in what not to do. Now, I understand that many of us have friends who are behind bars. I understand that we want our friends to have marijuana. Here's one way not to do that. A man in Washington state is accused of trying to get marijuana into a county jail facility by attaching it to an arrow, which he tried to shoot onto the roof of the jail. An employee of the Whatcom County Sheriff's Department saw the man get out of his pickup Tuesday morning and use a bow to shoot the arrow towards the second floor recreation area, recreation area which is on top of the jail, but he missed his target. The marijuana was reportedly wrapped in a plastic bag taped to the center of the arrow. The man, David Wayne Jordan, 36, was arrested for investigation of introducing contraband into the jail, resisting arrest, and obstructing law enforcement, according to Sheriff Bill Elfo. Jordan reportedly served 20 days in the jail earlier this month for assault and, for assault and resisting arrest, according to the Bellingham Herald. Sheriff Elfo said Jordan told deputies he had been aiming the arrow at a squirrel, but he had no good explanation why he attached marijuana to the arrow to go squirrel hunting. In any event, don't shoot arrows with marijuana on them at the jail, please. Whatever you do, try to find a way to amuse yourselves. Our Tote TV must read of the week this week is an excellent compilation by the tireless Washington-based activist, Carrie Boyder. Today, when I'm recording this, August 30th, marks the one-year anniversary of the death of Richard Floor in federal custody. We must never forget the injustice of what was done to Richard Floor. It serves as a stark example of the cruel inhumanity of the federal prohibition on marijuana. And what Carrie has done is to gather words from Richard Floor's widow, his daughter, his business partner, his friend, and Curry herself then contributes a few words. All of these together 
paint a powerful portrait of a man who should never have been arrested, who was serving patients, and who was abiding by Montana state law when he was arrested by federal authorities and then thrown in prison. So don't miss that story. R.I.P. Richard Floor, Remembering a Victim of the War on Medical Marijuana, compiled by Kerry Boyder on Tokesignals.com. Don't forget to send in your bud pictures to Tokesignals at gmail.com, and your bud could be famous. It could be our bud pick of the week next week. Don't forget to tune in next week for the next edition of Toke TV. Until that time, and we see each other again, Stay lifted.